In a previous video, we showed a pump manufacturer's curve, as we have in front of us, and that had lines that represented the pump curve for a capacity or a flow rate, a volumetric flow rate, versus a total head in feet. This gave the information what our pump is able to achieve. What we want to do now on a system curve is to look at how can we relate what's actually happening on our system versus this curve. We are going to start with a mechanical energy balance as we've got in front of us. And if you recall, this is the version that is in meters. If I do a simple rearranging, I'm going to take the WS and I'm going to put it in the front. And I will then group all the similar terms of pressure, height and velocity together. So we've got the outs and the ins together and I'll leave the friction at the end. So we now have an equation that relates the head of our system to the pressure, the height, the velocity, and the friction terms, as I've got it in the equation above. What we want to do with this final equation is we now want to plot the head, which will be h on the y-axis, against the volumetric flow rate, which was q. The way I typically solve this equation and I've copied it here again, is to use Excel, which makes the formulas a whole lot easier. But the way I'm doing it here is quite as easy to use a piece of paper and just do the calculations like that. So ultimately, we want an equation, Ws on mg, so that's the h, which is in meters, is equal to some function with a velocity term into it. So we can then plot that as a y is equal to something for x. So that's where we are going to. So we're going to now try and look at this equation and convert that into something of a similar nature. So like I say, we have the h on the left and we need to now convert to the right. The first term, the pressure, is often going to be known and it's going to be constant and the pressure in is going to be known and it's constant. So we can take those constant values and I can simply write them down as our constant value in the top block, as I've written here, of all my constant values. In the same way, z out and z in is also going to be known, and that is also going to be a constant, so I can write that in for my height in my list of constants in my Excel spreadsheet. In most of our equations, velocity squared out minus velocity squared in is going to drop down to zero because the velocity out and the velocity in is going to be constant, so that will fall away. In some of the examples, you might see that the diameter of the pipe changes, so that your velocities may change. If this happens, you will now not have a constant, but you'll need to put this into the table below, which we will get to shortly. The last term here is the pressure, and we are now going to be left with a delta Pf is equal to 4F Le over D rho V squared on 2, and we now need to solve that, and that will not be constant because the f is going to change as Reynolds number changes, and it's also not known because at the moment we don't know what the velocity is. What we do now see though is that we have an equation. Let's just rub that out. So we have this ws term on the left, so is h is equal to a pressure term plus the z term plus, this will often fall away to zero, plus a delta pf term, and please remember this is not in the right units at the moment, but here we have our velocity term here, so we've got various values where h is equal to something plus plus and a velocity squared here. So we've now got the right equation such that we can plot it. The trick now is to get this delta pf into the correct form so that we can now get this equation for h. The way that I would now solve that equation is to use it in the table in front of us, as I mentioned earlier. Ultimately, we want to have the two columns, Q for the volumetric flow rate and H, so that we can take this H and Q and plot it onto the pump manufacturer's curve. So before, if you remember, there was a Q on the x-axis and an H on the y-axis. The first step is going to be to look at the Q. So we don't have the Q values, but this is where we are going to start with our guessing. I'm going to guess 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way down to 190. And this is because it's in Excel. I can simply copy and paste and hopefully all of the formula in this table will match. And we've got lots of data points. The reason I'm doing this 
is because if we look on this graph, we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. For now, I'd like you just to ignore the units. I'm going to pretend that we have the same units. Is that the same units? Okay. We're going to pretend that I have the same units on this graph of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and you'll see it goes all the way up to 190. So I want to match the points on this graph to the points in my table. If they don't match, please do the unit conversion as you should do here so that the units match. In the same way, I'm going to ignore this feet and we're going to pretend that this is in meters. Okay, so we now have our first column, the Q. From this Q, we're now going to be interested to add in all the values as we had in this equation above, such that we can get the total H, which is down here. We said, however, that we can't just simply calculate this because of this delta PF. We need to solve for delta PF before we can add that in. So to do that, we are going to take the Q values and we're going to convert them into a velocity term as we have on the left. That velocity we're going to get from the Q value and the diameter, so that's up in the top left hand corner, which I can get from our question, which we'll fill in. I can convert the diameter to an area and I can use that to then get a linear velocity in meters per second. From that value, that meters per second value that I've now calculated, I can take that and convert, or not convert, I can calculate a Reynolds number, which was rho v d on mu. And again, in the table, I've already got the diameter, so we can fill in the diameter from the constant. The velocity is coming from the cell to the left. The density, we can calculate, or we would be given, or we would know that it's water or oil, so we've got the density value here as well as the viscosity. So these are all our constants in the top and we now have our Reynolds number. After that, I can use that Reynolds number and I can look up the friction factor value on a Fanning friction factor curve or a Moody value and I can read that off and I can put it into this table. From that friction factor, I can then calculate a pressure drop due to friction. So delta PF, 4F, L over D, rho V squared on two. Please don't forget if there are bends and valves and fittings, you would calculate this delta PF in exactly the same way to take into account all of those. You might want to put those either in a column of their own, so add another column in, or you might want to put that into this area of constants as I've got in the top. Once you've got all of these values, we can now see that we've got the correct values, and let me try and use a different color here. We've got the term for the delta PF. Please convert to the right units for meters. We've got the value for pressure, which we have in the top here. We have the value for height. In this example, there is no velocity, so that term falls away from our original equation. So in the column for the H, the head loss, we can then write it is equal to all of those terms added together to give us the H. Once you have your first column, it's easy to copy each of the rows. So we take that column, that sorry, that row, copy, and paste and just move it down to as many rows as you want. Please, however, note that this F is not by a formula, so you'd have to go back and check each time what the Reynolds number is and check what the friction factor is and then calculate through. I have simplified this here. I haven't taken any roughness into account. I don't know what material it is, so please just make sure you get the correct F. There are simplifications or we say equations that can estimate F, so if you find any of those, you are allowed to use those F approximations in an exam. If you are told you can use it, otherwise please read it off the graph every time to get the F value. So once you do that, you will find that you have various different values for your X value, sorry, for your Q value, as well as for your H value. And if we remember Q is actually our X, and the H is our Y, so we can take this data on here and we can go back down to our graph. Please remember you need to have this in the right unit, so make sure that you divide through by the density, the mass as you need, and you can plot this onto this curve. This curve, if we now just go back up quickly, we said that H, that's our Y, is equal to something, 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 and we had a velocity squared term in here. Because of that velocity squared, you're going to find that your system curve it's going to start at some point and because of that squared nature it's going to go up as per the squared. 
the distance from the bottom to the top, you'll find is going to be the difference in your delta Z. So if there is no delta Z, this will actually start at the origin. What we now have is our system curve. So the green one is our system curve. This relates to what happens in our actual system and has nothing to do with the pump. We have, however, plotted it onto the pump curve. And if our pump curve is the one that I'm highlighting in red, we can now determine the operating point. So let me just write that pump. So we can theoretically operate our system curve at any point along this curve. I can physically change the pump such that I set it at 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever I want cubic meters per second as we have in the system. However, what you will see is that if we set it at any point, so let me just highlight this quickly, if I set it at any point below the intercept, so if I set it such that the flow rate falls on any of the, on this point, that is highlighted. It is possible that we can get the correct flow. However, what we now want are these points in the circles, and what we get is the red circle over here. So we are actually getting more head than we need. And if we're getting more head than we need, we are effectively getting more energy. So the pump is giving more energy to the system than what we actually need. And in this instance, we are wasting energy. Similarly, if we look at the section above the intercept, we now have the circles that I've got in the green versus the red circles that the pump is giving us. We can again, by this graph, we can see that we are able to get a pump that delivers the flow rate, but the pump is now not able to give. It's not giving us enough head. So this system will not work. So above the intercept, the system will not work. Below this intercept, we are wasting energy. So because of that, the point that we are going to choose as our operating point, it's going to be the most efficient point on the graph, is going to be the intercept. Okay, so just neatening, neatening that up a bit. What we are now saying is that if we have a pump curve in the red and the green curve is our system curve, the point where they intercept is going to be our operating point. And from that operating point, we can read off the actual Q value and then along to the left, and we can read off our actual head for this system with this six inch pump as in front of us.